Well, um, yes, now I'm going to talk about the scientific state of the art. This is especially important if you want to uh, consider OMR for your own work, because as my colleagues have been showing, uh, most of the commercial tools are designed for modern notation in perfect quality, so this is probably the less interesting uh, a scenario for librarians or for musicologists having like all the graded images. So I think it is, it is interesting for you to know how OMR is actually being uh, dealt with. Okay, well, yeah, sometimes this is underestimated and a lot of people tend to say, why are you researching on OMR? This was solved like 10 years ago or five years ago, oh, come on. Well, uh, we have seen that OMR is back from a lot, long, long time. And there has been much independent research on this topic, and some of the past research is covered in some service. Like, uh, we especially recommend the ones by Plostin and Bear in 1992, and Anna Rebelo uh, wrote a very interesting survey some years ago. And, but now, wait, where is the mouse? Where is, where is the mouse? <laughs> oh! Yes, sorry. I wasn't paying attention to you. I, I really knew what you were saying. Okay. So, uh, deep learning has brought breakthrough in computer vision, which includes OMR. And the current state of the art can be organized into the static scenario in which the OMR system is supposed to do all the work. We'll see that there are two main approaches the full pipeline approaches and the end to end approaches. But also, we have the interactive scenario in which we assume that the user will be there for the OMR system to, to be improved. Um, one of the things I would like to say at this point is that in previous OMR research, a lot of techniques were de developed especially designed for a type of application, for a type of music manuscript or uh, style of handwritten. But now we are mostly using uh, machine learning, which means that you can change the data you are using to train the models, and the model is expected to work on this new data. Okay, so I think this is now becoming really useful for people that want to apply OMR in their work, but they don't know how to. So you can just use the state-of-the-art methods and modify the, the ground truth provided to, to train in the models. Okay, so let's go, let's go through them. First of all, the full pipeline approaches. Well, full pipeline approaches means the traditional workflow of OMR that we heard from, from Ichiro, but also was mentioned by one of my colleagues, which basically consists of some stages that are performed sequentially to the input images, mostly per processing, music symbol recognition, notation assembly, and then coding. Okay, uh, this is a reproduction of the, of the organization that Anna Rebello uh, displayed in her paper, which we see that all of these these stages comprise more steps, inside, depending on our needs, so depending on the complexity of the image we are dealing with. But basically, the four main stages are commonly shared by by the researchers approaching the full pipeline. This is how things are being done right now in the CIRSA project that I will talk later a bit, in which again we have the same four stages perhaps with different names, the dif di some different steps within them, but basically the idea is the same. So well, the first stage is the preprocessing, uh, in which we want to facilitate the processing of the subsequent stages, like for example, enhancing the, the important information of the image, correcting the skew of the image, and, and so on. This may, be, this may seem useless when we have uh, ideal image conditions, but it is especially relevant, relevant when we have degraded all documents. Uh, nowadays, the, uh, the, the task that is getting more attention is what is called document layout analysis, which basically consists in separating the different sources of information that we get in the image, and which is required for some workflows. Okay, as said before, the document layout analysis 
has the objective of separating the different layers of graphical information. This is important to emphasize here. Traditionally, the layers of interest are the background, the stuff lines, the music symbols, and text, because these are useful for many reasons, such as, for example, we may want to separate the background from the foreground, because the foreground has the, the relevant information of the score. We may also want to detect where the stuff lines are, because the stuff lines may be uh, hinder recognition of the music symbols, but they are useful for things like knowing the scale of the, of the image, or they provide a good reference for performing the, the skew of the image, and also for detecting where the different staffs are. We may also want to separate the text and the music, because text is going to be processed by OCR, and the music notation is going to be processed by OMAR, and some workflows need that we provide the layer with only the symbols. So these four layers provide, uh, most of the times, are the ones that we are interested in separating. So historically there have been a number of approaches for dealing with related problems, like, such as binarization, layers detection, stuff line detection, and so on because the, the combined use of these specific strategies may lead to a complete layout analysis. For example, uh, how the document layout analysis has been uh, approached is that we get the input image, then we binarize it, we extract the lyrics, and we finally remove, well, detect the stuff lines. So each of these stages was um, approached by single algorithms. Now, however, the direct layout analysis approach is under research. This is the demo that has been shown before, in which the task is formulated as a pixel-wise classification task. We want to know the category of each pixel, to, to which layer of information they belong to. And we can solve this with machine learning strategies, which is the state of the art now for, this, for the document layout analysis. Of course, the main drawback is the ground truth if data is required, but the good thing is that as long as we have appropriate ground truth data for our documents, we can use the same model, I mean the same approach for our own manuscripts. Okay, so this is one example of the state of the art for document layout analysis in which each pixel of the image is classified with uh, a convolutional neural network so that the thing is that we query every single pixel and we use as features in order to know, in order to get information of that pixel, we extract the surrounding region, the pixel, we want to classify the pixel which is in the middle of this region. So we train a convolutional neural network, which is the state of the art in most image processing tasks, so that we have a model that is able that given a region, give us the probability of each category to be assigned for the pixel in the middle of that page. So this approach is based on machine learning, which means that we change the ground truth data so we can apply the same approach in, in a different manuscript, and it is getting uh, quite good results. There's sometimes you get some noisy, spurious points, but the approach is working mostly correctly. The problem with this approach is that it takes a long, long time to classify a high-resolution image because each of the pixels of the image has to be classified. That's why recently... Oh, sorry, I, I forgot this slide. As I've mentioned that the four layers of interest are background, text, stuff lines, and music symbols, but sometimes you may be interested in other types of graphical layers. So, for example, Ben and Pujam are using the same approach for extracting the handwritten annotations from, I think, Beethoven, I don't really remember, sorry. Beethoven, yes, okay. So the thing is that, since this is based on machine learning, we can select the categories that we are interested in, just change the, the ground truth data. In this case, we only need to know if the pixel belongs to a handwritten annotation or not, and we just use the very same approach for a different topic, like in this work. But still, we have the problem of the time. We, I mean, if we are using high resolution images, like usual, we may have like 300 times 600 pixels, which takes 
a long long time to, to query every single pixel. So very recently there has been um, proposed an approach that instead of going seeing, uh, pixel by pixel, it takes a whole patch of the image and classify into the corresponding layers. This is done by the combination of one model that is uh, specialized in each of the layers of interest and after detecting the layers separately it combines the results in order to get the actual document layout analysis and as we have uh, I'm showing there it is getting very good results in the same task and the good thing for you is that this work will be presented tomorrow in Izmir so this is the hot state of the art I mean this is even <laughs> this hasn't been presented yet but if you are interested, you can go tomorrow to the presentation and know more details about it. Although the presentation is only four minutes, so basically, this <laughs> is what I have said here. Okay, well, as a quick comparison between these two approaches, we can see this table that both the patch-wise and the pixel-wise are getting very good results for this task. They take a reasonable time to train, but the processing time is very different while in the patchwise approach we can process <coughs> one minute it takes one minute per processing a high resolution page the pixel wise approach takes like six hours six hours which is uh, uh, quite long uh, but the main drawback of the patchwise approach is that we need more ground truth data we need to provide like five high resolution pages in which each pixel is annotated correctly which may also take some time Okay, then, after the pro processing of the, of the image, we move on to the music symbol classification, which basically consists in detecting and categorizing the symbol components of the image. There are two main approaches of, well, yeah, two main approaches of understanding how this process should be taken into account. One of them is if we consider primitives, like no heads, our stems, beams, or if we want to directly consider symbols, in which case a core may be uh, three symbols, the beam group is split into two eighth nodes, and so on. So we are not discussing here the pros and cons of each approach, just it's important to keep in mind that depending on how you understand this stage, you will have to do different things in both earlier and posterior stages. Well, traditionally, this, this as uh, Ichiro mentioned in the introduction, the idea is that you remove the stuff lines and run some connected component analysis for localizing the primitives or the symbols, and then you run a classifier. But this uh, was difficult at the beginning because the stuff line removal was considered a main obstacle for this and much research was devoted to solving, to solving it. We had some surveys only about the staff line removal, even some competitions about the staff line removal. What I tried to say that it was like the hot topic for OMR for some time, but currently it can be easily uh, solved with the document layout analysis state that I, that I went through before. Once we have isolated the symbols, we can run a classifier. There was also a lot of uh, research on this issue, but nowadays with the deep convolutional neural networks, we can classify very well any well-defined set of symbol categories, as long as we know, um, as long as we have some ground truth data to train these models. The problem is that even we can solve the stuff and removal very well, and we can solve the classifier. Isolating the, the music symbols by means of connected components is still problematic because it is difficult to handle all the situations. For example, there could be multiple primitives that are connected, like what happens with no heads and stems and beams in a beam group, but also a single unit can have multiple disconnected components. It happened with a Fermata, Volta, or DFQF and, and, and its dots. So modeling all possible appearances becomes intractable. As Alex said before, you may want to start with a very simple set of rules, but at the end, you, the, the problem will become intractable. So, and this is especially severe in, if we want to recognize handwritten notation, which is 
much more unconstrained. So currently, there is a trend towards the direct music symbol detection, in which, well, detection means that we are both localizing and classifying at the same time, directly over the image. The advantage is that we have an elegant formulation, we just provide an image and we get a set of bounding boxes. The second advantage is that we as researchers or as users, we can define which primitives or which symbols that we want to take into account. And another good thing is that we can run this in a single training stage. We, we just provide for model an image, a set of bounding boxes, and the model will be able to generalize to other scores that has not been seen during training. Okay, as said, there is a current trend towards this idea, and we have seen recently some papers about um, using this formulation, for example, using general object detection that come from the computer vision community. Object detection in uh, images has been one of the main problems of computer vision. We are just we can just take their developments to be applied in our in music notation. We have seen some works about it in which we see that there are two main approaches, one stage detectors and two stage detectors, but we have also seen some works that dealt with this problem specifically for OMR, like the UNETS by Jan and the Watershed detector. And these two works are also very, I mean, in the state of the art because they are going to be presented in this mirror as well. So if you are interested, tomorrow is your day. You can learn much more than today. Okay, very quickly, the idea of the detectors is that, for example, the one stage detector considers all the pixels of an image are poten can potentially be potentially oh, sorry potentially be the center of a of an object. So the model classifies each pixel as regards uh, its category, which can be background, which means that there is no object there. And also, as regards, where is the bounding box of that of that object with the center in the in the pixel that is being classified? The two stage detector is uh, they compose the same idea into two stages. The first stage uh, goes through all pixels and decides whether a pixel is, in, is can be a box, which means object next classification, and if so that pixel is considered in a second stage in which the pixel is actually given a category about the pixel, uh, sorry, about the category of the, of the object that has the center in that pixel and also the box is uh, predicted from it. The units, that, as I said, will be described more in depth tomorrow, consider a model that provides a probability map of each pixel of the input image to be any of the categories that are considered. So the idea is that for each category we get a different probability map which will highlight the pixels that may belong to that kind of objects and in a second stage we run a threshold and a connected component search will give us the, the regions in which this, this symbol may be. And last, we have the deep watershed detector that will also be presented tomorrow. Basically, the idea of this model is that it learns a function to map the input image into a topological surface in which the object to be detected has a basin in this topological surface so that they can be detected more, more easily. This is a comparison that we have uh, um, extracted from, from some experiments comparing the four uh, the four approaches for object for music object detection. The idea of this table is twofold. The first one is that there is a lot of room for improvement because the accuracy in the printed and written and written mentioned notation data sets is still far from optimal. Uh, we actually know that there are some of these results are already improved but when we ran this, this experiment, it was the state of the art. But another thing to mention here is that there are other 
parameters that we may want to take into account because some models perform much faster than others. For example, the one state detectors are not providing the best accuracy, but they are able to, to run like one page per second. So if we need this kind of, of the speed, we may want to choose the one state detectors. And on the other hand, we have the units of the deep water shell detector that may perform better, but for example, they take more than three days to be trained. So once either we have used the traditional stuff line removal plus classification stage or the direct music object detection, we need to assemble the actual music notation. So in the previous stage, we have just detected isolated units, or isolated components, and then it's when we convert those into actual music notation. Um, there are two relationships that are necessary for assemble the music notation, the first of which is a logical relationship, for example, what is it between an O-head and a stem, but also the temporal relationship, which guarantees the correct order of the symbols. The thing here is that this stage is strongly dependent on how we have performed the previous stage. So depending on the set of categories that we have considered, we may need a different approach for this semantical reconstruction, because the symbol primitives have not, are not strictly unambiguous. So traditionally, this part has been um, approached by handcrafted rules, which meant that we were trying to take into account all the possibilities. And we have seen algorithmic rules, context-free grammars, fuzzy modeling, top-down modeling, and so on. Only recently, in the work by Yang, which was, as I said before, is going to be presented tomorrow. He used decision trees to infer the relationship between the different components of the music of the detection stage. <coughs> and finally, in the full pipeline approach, we have to encode the recognition of the previous stages into any format that we desire, like music XML or MIDI. The thing is that this stage has received little attention from the OMR community, but it is logical because within OMR we cannot consider this as a part of our research. There are other communities that, have, that are developing music in common formats, so it's like their work to do this. As, as OMR researchers, we need to take into account how music is actually being encoded, but it's not part of our research to do this, to, to select this and okay. Hmm? Sit. No. <laughs> and Jorge will now tell us what the deal with the chicken is. No animal suffer during the preparation of this tutorial. <laughs> but well, the idea is that I'm going to talk now about end-to-end -end approaches in the sense that we don't care what happens in the middle. I mean, we just want our nuggets. We know they, well, we hope they come from the chicken. But <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Okay, so moving on to the end-to-end -end approaches in the scientific state of the art for OMR. Well, the idea of end-to-end -end means that we want to formulate the task without further subdividing the problem into smaller steps. So the idea is that we want to obtain directly the sequence of musical symbols in the image without doing this, all these stages that I mentioned before. So the advantage, the advantage is, is that we are performing a holistic process which uh, helps to, the, to preparing the experiments and using it and also that we need a less demanding gra ground truth data because we don't need to provide where the symbols are, uh, where the sublines are, and so on. So the idea is that we have an image and we want directly the expected output. Unfortunately, uh, nowadays we still don't have any model that is able to perform end-to-end -end for full music score images. Because of design limitations of the models that are currently used in the machine learning, they are only able to provide unidirectional sequences, which means something like a string. For example, in speech recognition, text recognition, we can 
the output is a sequence of characters that form words. But here we don't have the same output. However, this is enough so far for single staff and to end recognition. Well, the idea is very similar to what uh, we have shown before with Arrowspeak that was pioneered pioneer by Laurent Pujan using hidden macro models. We have seen three recent approaches using uh, formulating the task in an end to end way using deep learning models. Have the encoder decoder, convolutional recurrent neural network, the convolutional recurrent neural network with the connectionist temporal classification loss function, and a frame wise convolutional recurrent neural network. Let's go quickly through them. Well, the idea of the encoder decoder approach is that we have two models, two recurrent models, the first of which processes the input score through a sliding window, like here we are providing the input patch by patch to a convolutional neural network that is fed into an encoder, which is a model by a recurrent neural network, and after processing the image, we have a different model that takes the last stage of the encoder and step by step provides uh, the symbols of the input. So, in this work, they uh, codified the symbols with two elements. The first is the duration, which was codified respect to the bit, and the pitch in their, in their absolute codification. So, they ran some experiments with different uh, image conditions, and they were getting uh, some good results, around 15 sorry, 75% of accuracy in, in, the, in the conditions. The problem with this approach is that it is designed for, let's say, for getting a MIDI or for replaying the score because they are ignoring the time signature, the clef, or the part lines. They are just providing the pitches and the durations of the symbols in the score. But it was a good start for end-to-end for -end, uh, OMR. Well, the second approach that I'm uh, describing here is based on the state of the art for text recognition and speech recognition. We have a convolutional recurrent neural network, the, convolutional, the convolutions take care of processing the input image and extract, and extract um, meaningful features for the task, and then the recurrent part takes care of the sequential nature of the problem. The good thing about this approach is that it does not require um, we, don't know, we don't need to provide the location of the symbols in the image thanks to the connecting temporal classification, which unfortunately uh, it would take a long to explain here, but that's the main point behind this loss function. Oh, sorry, okay. So this is the idea, the input image, convolutional, recurrent, and then we get our output. And as said, we can train this in a single training stage with the CTC loss function. Okay, uh, this is something I'm presenting tomorrow in Izmir. So again, we are there in the state of the art. In printed clean images, this is working at, well close to optimal results. When we distort the images, the model is still able to learn quite well. And of course, this is only covering a subset of the input domain because we are we can only deal with single staff images. But this is quite interesting for all music because, for example, handwritten notation, well, sorry, menstrual notation, either handwritten or printed, is mostly a single staff systems in the graphical sense. In menstrual notation, so we have polyphony, but they are written in different pages. So. For, this, uh, for the recognition, we can consider them as monophonic. And this uh, approach is able to get around 90% of accuracy at the symbol level for handwritten measure notation and 96 for square notation. As I said, we only need to provide pairs of images and the corresponding uh, sequence of symbols to train this model. And last, there is a very recent approach with a frame-wise convolutional recurrent neural network by Baro, Arnaud Baro, in which they have two outputs in the network, one for the rhythm and another for the pitch. The good thing is that um, given that this is frame-wise, we can do this, like separating rhythm and pitch, 
but the problem is that we need to annotate the image frame by frame, which means in, we need to say what is what appears in each of the columns of the input image. It takes it may take a long time. Well, they are getting good results in printed scores. They are more getting perfect results as well. They are not getting so good results in handwritten score, but to be honest, um, they don't have much training data. So perhaps with enough training data, they will be getting good results for handwritten scores as well. However, this approach has some limitations, so given that pitch and rhythm outputs are separated, we may have some ambiguous situations, for example, well, this is a good example, we have, in, in this frame, we will get an activation for the plug no head, but we will get two pitches activated, or even worse, here we have a plug no head and a white no head activated and two pitches, and there's no way of knowing which pitch goes with each of the, uh, of the heads. So, um, to an approach it has appeared recently in the OMR literature. The problem is that we have not been able to run some comparative experiments because all of them have used different ground truth, different formats, different scenarios. So it would be good for the near future to run some comparison between them in order to know the pros and cons of each in, in different scenarios. Well, and this is the last part of the scientific state of the art, talking about interactive systems. So the idea is that OMR systems are far from being error free and they will probably remain as that forever. I mean, it's hard to say that our system will work always correctly. So if we need a perfect recognition, because we are, for example, a storing a structured representation of our music scores, we need to correct the errors anyway. So the idea of interactive systems is that they put the user in the recognition loop in order to provide feedback and reducing the, the effort to get these perfect recognition results. So currently we have two main approaches for this. One um, that is being developed in SIMSA, the full pad light interactive workflow in the um, in the in Ichiro's lab and the user constraint optimization by uh, mostly Christopher Raphael and, and his students. Okay, so this is the idea of since the project. We have the, the, um, the traditional pipeline and we assume that the user will be in some points of the workflow in order to correct the errors that happen in each of these stages. So in the first case, in the image preprocessing part, they consider the pixel-wise approach that I mentioned before, but they are using a tool called pixel.js, which is a tool that allows us to correct errors of the legend processes of the, of the layer processes at pixel level. So the idea is that when you face a new manuscript type, you run a model train on a different type of scores, and then you get some preliminary classification results that you can correct with pixel.js so that you get, a, well, on, on the one hand, a corrected page, but on the other hand, a specific ground truth of that manuscript type. So then you can train a specialized machine learning algorithm and repeat the process when new pages are received. So eventually, in some few iterations, you will get a specialized machine learning algorithm for the manuscript type that you are dealing with in this moment. For the second part, once we have proposed the image, we'll, they run the interactive classifier, which means that um, the symbols that have been detected have to be classified, and the idea is that at the beginning you don't know the categories of the symbols, but you are able to, you're, you're supposed to go correcting all of them, and the system dynamically reclassifies the remaining ones, so that if you have, for example, if you classify this symbol and you assign it its category, the system will probably know without any further uh, interaction that these symbols are belonging to the same to the same type. So the idea is what with few corrections you can have all the symbols correctly classified. And in the last stage, the music notation reconstruction, they have this tool, Neon.js, in which you can manually modify the pitches of the symbols, correct 
some stuff that have fallen in different lines incorrectly and so on. So the idea that after the process you get your perfect result over. And very finally, we have the user consent optimization by Jan Shen and Christopher Raphael, in which the user can force the model to fulfill some constraints. So they are using in their base system a dynamic programming approach. So the well the system tries its best and after all the user can perform two actions. One is to force a certain pixel to belong to a symbol category, which may be helpful to uh, correct remaining errors that are touching that pixel, that are connected to that pixel. And more interestingly, they have this model constraint. So the idea is that uh, we have been saying during this session, there are many rare events in music notation. So somehow uh, it could be an advantage to consider only a simplified subset of these rules. So the idea is when we find one of these rare elements, like for example a clef, which is in a non-standard position, we can tell the system to consider that specific uh, exception. So the idea is to, well, dynamically correct the remaining errors by providing feedback to the system. 